Hello, welcome again to another episode of Time with Father. I'm Father Musumichi, coming to you from America's heartland, St. Mary's, Kansas, the agricultural belt of the U.S., the wheat basket of America. And I use these terms of introduction because of the topic I'd like to speak to you about today, the rogation days, these three days that we're in the midst of at the moment. Um, what does it mean? It's from the Latin to ask, to make request. And what are they? There are three days of penance and prayer before Ascension Thursday. And the purpose of these, I could list four, and I'll call them the four A's. First, to ask mercy from God. We are in constant need of God's mercy. We completely depend upon God for everything. And so we need to ask him for his mercy. Second, to appease the just anger of God because of our many sins of society and of mankind. We deserve punishment. And yet, so we're asking, we're doing penitential works and sacrifices so that we can appease the just anger of God. Thirdly, to avert disasters of nature, different chastisements, calamities, whatever you want to call them. Um, and finally, fourth, to acquire the blessings of God. We have in this area and in throughout the world, different agricultural pursuits and livestock, which we, we depend on for our livelihood, for our sustenance. So we're asking God for, for blessings for the, you know, the, the births of the new animals in the stables and that our crops would produce a, a fruitful harvest. Why now? So we're in the midst of this Easter time, this time of joy, and the church has us put these three days in before um, Ascension Thursday. And so if we're to understand it, we need to see it as the way Rome sees it. It's of a, of a, of a holy institution. Uh, without interrupting our Paschal joys, it actually tempers it. And the violet vestments used during the processions and the mass do not signify that Jesus has left us, but rather that the time of his departure is approaching. And we're reminded how radically dependent we are on God through his creation and how prayer can help protect us from nature's often cruel ways. Consider the world we live in today. We live in Tornado Alley. We often have severe storms in the area. I was just out last week driving and there was an announcement on the radio saying that there was severe hail storm in the area. So softball size hail and I didn't have, you know, internet on my phone or anything like that. So I, I didn't know where it was exactly. I wasn't even sure what county I was, this was south of Topeka. I wasn't sure what county I was passing through. And I can kind of tell by looking at the animals, some were grazing and I would drive a little bit further and the animals looked spooked. They were like standing all together in a little huddle. And, and then a little bit further, I would drive, and then the animals were grazing again. So I figured I cleared the harmful area just by looking at the animals and seeing how they were reacting. Because you can imagine softball-sized hail would, you know, destroy the horses and the cows out there, destroy all the produce that's being grown in the fields. So we have other things to be concerned about as well. We had flooding out here last year throughout the Midwest. Uh, droughts are possible, uh, fires, lightning storms, even viruses and plagues. And um, God's express, these, all these things can come about through God's express will or just for his permissive will. Sometimes it just happens either way. We look back about a hundred years ago, there was this um, Spanish flu going on and it was very devastating at the time. What was particularly devastating about this virus is that it affected the young children. So you think of Jacinta and Francesco, uh, the two children in Fatima who died from this virus, the Spanish flu. And so we could see a hundred years ago, these things are still possible. Um, we can think, I know we're going through this coronavirus right now, and we could look at, you know, kind of various statistics. We've got um, reports out as of late, that's from Stanford University, from Southern University of Southern Cal, from the University of Washington, Miami, Dade County, University of Miami, def, def, several different reputable medical journeys, 
we have other countries like Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, and now the National Institute of Health is, is doing a, another um, study. And it seems that all of these things show that this coronavirus is not in comparison at all to the Spanish flu of 100 years ago. We're looking at now from all these different um, university reports, it looks like we're looking at a 0.2%, which is a little bit like the flu, uh, maybe a 0.4. So that's one out of a thousand, two out of a thousand, or you know, four out of a thousand deaths, as opposed to flu being one out of a thousand. And so we could see, and this is re this is in regard this is regardless of any social distancing. So when I mention these numbers, that's just the flat numbers. That's without any social distancing. Or if we would have just had a normal uh, last month or so, you would have get the same results. So we would kind of see now. We didn't know then. Actually, we did know from early April. Some of these reports were coming out that this was going to be not so bad. Uh, yet the media does what it does and makes everything a big mess. And so now we have the other problems that are coming out now because of because of this. When a simple herd immunity would have worked just fine. Yes, they were fine. The World Health Organization was at first committing a, a 3% death rate. Um, but we know their mathematical models were wrong. But now we have real scientific data coming out. So we can see, I guess, these stay at home orders were just overdone, over overreacting. But also, we have as well, different other things back 100 years ago, the Dust Bowl. So what this was is a lot of drought in the area. And then, you know, great winds blowing through this part of the country, the topsoil blows away, and the farmland becomes useless. And so it shows us that we need to be humble before God. And all the in spite of anything can happen, um, great calamity can approach at any time. And so we need to stay humble before God. We know God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And going back, we can look at the history of these rogation days. Um, we know, first of all, there were processions in the Old Testament. We have King David and King Solomon, you know, bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant into the temple in Jerusalem. And then, but this particular, um, this particular Rogation days started, it has a French origin. We go back to the year 469 um, in the town of Vienne, France, on the Rhone River. Uh, there was great crop failures, earthquakes, various plagues of all kinds affecting animals and people. And the saintly bishop Mamertus um, called for three days of supplications, penance, processions, and when the whole diocese got together and prayed, singing psalms and asking for God's intercession in this matter, a great miracle came, the plague stopped. And so it wasn't until about 100 years later, uh, less than that, I guess, in the 6th century that uh, we had the Council of Orleans, Orleans in France. And it, this was all the, the bishops that were kind of in alliance with King Clovis. And so they made it a, a, a feast for France. And then the church later on, it became universal in the whole of church. So at a later time too, there was, it would call for complete fasting and abstinence. There were six hour processions. People would go around barefoot, going from station to station, praying these different songs. Okay, now I'd like to speak just for a moment on the liturgy. So we start with a procession, and we would do this at the seminary every year for those three days, and it's done as well as St. Mary. So some of you have graduated in the school, you would have done these in the years past, going around into the yard, praying. Um, and so this is a figure of our life here on this earth. We're here as pilgrims on this earth. We're, this is not our home. We're just strangers passing through. And so that's what this um, brings to mind in these processions. And then also it's a public profession of our faith to show the world the true faith, the true um, salvation that can be found in our Lord Jesus Christ, and as well as to show our dependence on God because 
while we're on these, like I said, in, in the Middle Ages, they would go on six hour processions. They would be subject to all kind of weather conditions. So they needed to depend on God especially. And so if we look now at the, so we have the procession, but then within it, the litany of the saints is said or sung. So we start off with Lord have mercy on us. So those first parts where we're beseeching God directly to have mercy on us. Then we go into the litany of the saints where we ask the saints to pray for us, to intercede on our behalf. And then we go to a section called deliver us, O Lord. And we're asking to be delivered from all evil, from all sin, from wrath, from bad weather, from storms, plagues, famines, wars, most especially though everlasting damnation. There's the, the next section is the Te Rogamus Hari Nos. It's usually sung in the, in the litany, uh, which means we beseech the O Lord to hear us. And so we're asking God to pardon our sins, to bring true repentance to us, to give us Christians rulers. We're, we live in an age today where there are not many people who stand up for the rights of God. And so we need these people uh, to rule over us in all parts of society. We ask also to be delivered from eternal death. And all of this comes about through the redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, his passion and death at Calvary 2000 years ago, his resurrection, we, we enter pretty soon in the days of Ascension and then Pentecost. And all of this is the plan of redemption that God has wrought for us. And we have now after the procession, you go into the chapel and mass is offered there. And what it is, is the divine Paschal Lamb being offered. He is the one mediator in a strict sense, the one mediator between God and man. Um, so he unites his most powerful prayers with our weak, measly prayers. And we pray that, that the consolation that we receive from our Lord um, in our afflictions through all the afflictions of life will move us to a higher knowledge of God, a higher love as well. And the mask uses in the epistle, the um, St. James chapter five, where it talks about Elias the prophet being a just man back in the days of Israel, uh, where they had wicked rulers. He prayed and a, a drought came and for three and a half years, there was no rain. And then he prayed again and it rained. And so it just shows, first of all, the power of a just man's prayer. And so we need to be, we need to be these just people as well um, so that God can hear our prayers when we pray. And we get from um, St. Luke is the gospel, uh, chapter 11, where Jesus gives us that message on, I call it the acronym of ASK, A-S-K. So ask and you shall find, seek and it shall be given to you, uh, knock and it shall be opened to you. So we know that um, it's important for us to ask and to pray and to go before God at all times of our life and to beseech him for our needs. And we know that if a, a man, a, a father, if a son would ask for some bread, he wouldn't give him a stone. Or if he asked for a fish, he wouldn't give him a snake. Or if the son asked for an egg, he wouldn't receive a scorpion. So, you know, humankind being evil, how much more should we expect from our good father in heaven who loves us and who would give us his great Holy Spirit for those who ask. So we need to see in all these days our dependence in God. Um, there are devastating forces of nature that can always become around us. We see with this coronavirus, or this wasn't really devastating, but it could have been. Uh, we didn't know at first, but now we know. Uh, but for whatever reason, the media still plays on this. But in a way, we're sort of buffered in our modern society. We don't depend so much on the land like we used to. We just go to the grocery store and buy our groceries. Um, but we need to see how important, how, how much we really depend on God. If there was a disruption in the, in the supply chain, even in transportation, 
we would be greatly affected. I mean, we see some of the problems that are going on now, maybe with the meats and things like that, um, where just a slight uh, disruption c can cause uh, difficulties. But you can imagine maybe a major war or a, a major outbreak of something uh, very contagious and deadly uh, that can really affect our society in just a moment's time. So we see how much we need to depend on God. God wants from us persevering prayer, and we know prayer is efficacious. Yes, prayer works. Prayer is what we need. And what exactly does prayer consist? We can say there are four elements in prayer which should always be included. The first is worship, to give God the praise and adoration that he deserves to glorify his name. The second, there must be sorrow in our soul for our sins. We can, we can do this and express this through our mortifications and through penance, through acts in our lives. Thirdly, there must be thanksgiving. We've received many great benefits from God. Everything, every good gift comes from above. And so we need to acknowledge this and to be thankful for it to God. Um, just think just think of the grace, the divine grace, the divine life of God in our soul, our families, our friends, our loved ones, all of our the things that God blesses, the sustenance, our homes, our church, all these we should acknowledge and give God's thanks. And then finally, to ask God for those things that we need. Um, he wants us to ask. Remember, ask and you shall find, seek and you seek and it shall be given to you. Knock and it shall be open to you. These are the words of our Lord, and he wants some persistence in our prayers. So I'd like to go now to a slow time of meditation. We can think of the world today that we live in, the countless sins committed every day in the world, and see how important it is that we beg for God's mercy. It was, as it was in the day of Noah, where all flesh, all mankind was corrupted, had they begged for mercy, he could have relented, but they didn't. And so what had happened? The flood came and washed those everyone away. They were living in a false sense of security. And so it would be in the last days as well, where prayer, where prayer will be as rare as faith. They will, the church will be decimated by compromises, by persecutions, by apostasies, there will be the heresy of nations, the religious indifference in the people. People will be Catholic in name only. The truths will be diminished as they already are. And the state will demand that the God to be worshipped will be liberty. There will be essentialism that will conspire to abolish the cross of Christ from the minds of men. So as there advances in the agricultural scientists, science, sometimes they make boasts that famines are impossible, but these are all blasphemies of God. And as we look at Abraham, when he called to God and prayed, he was in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he prayed, um, if you just had 10 righteous men here, would you avoid this destruction? And so it shows the power that we have, even just a few people praying. So, so we need to look and consider as we can compare the indifference of the Catholics in the present age with this days of rogation, with the devotion wherein our ancestors kept them, we cannot acknowledge that there has been a great falling off of faith and piety in the world today. Remember that the object of the rogation days is to appease the anger of God, to avert the chastisements, which the sins of the world so justly deserve, and moreover, to draw down divine blessings from the fruits of the earth. We beg God for the avoidance of these evils, such as war, famine, plagues, pestilence. And at the same time, it is a preparation for the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, this great feast coming upon us, who is the most powerful mediator with his Father, in whom we should especially invoke during these days. I'd like to close now with a prayer from the Litany of the Saints that's done in the processions. It says, O God, who by sin are offended and by penance pacified, 
mercifully regard the prayers of thy people, making supplication to thee, and turn away the scourges of thine anger, which we deserve for our sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Thank you. God bless you. And if you can get a chance, it would be a good idea, maybe even with the whole family, to gather together and to pray these prayers during this time. And if not, if you catch this video at a later time, it's still never too late. The, pray the prayers of a just man availeth much. God bless you. Thank you.